Whether you call it Kveik, Kvik, or Kvike, there's no denying that this unique Norwegian yeast has had a remarkable impact on the brewing scene, and Imperial Yeast's A43 Loki is one of the best versions out there. With the ability to produce a clean beer when fermented as warm as 104 degrees Fahrenheit or 40 degrees Celsius, you heard that right. While also performing well at more standard ale temperatures, Imperial Yeast A43 Loki is as versatile as it gets, meaning you have zero excuses for failing to brew throughout the year. Learn more about A43 Loki at imperialyeast.com and grab a pouch for your next batch to see what all the fuss is about. While the good majority of beer is made from four ingredients, water, malt, hops, and yeast, uh, some styles call for the addition of certain spices and tended to liven things up a bit by adding unique and to many desirable characteristics. Uh, perhaps the easiest way to impart beer with such flavors is to toss spices directly into either the boil or during fermentation. However, some view this as being a rather haphazard approach as it leaves room for uh, little room for controlling the amount of spice character in the finished beer. You're listening to the Brewlosophy Podcast. I'm your host, Marshall Schott, and joining me to talk about using tinctures as a means of adding spice to beer is contributor Cade Job. Yeah, I hope you guys like spice beers because we're going to talk a lot about them uh, today. I know, I know, uh, Marshall especially loves those pumpkin beers every time. Oh in the fall. yeah, come on. That's, there's some sarcasm for you guys, uh, <laughs> but no, yeah, I like spice beers. I brewed with spices. Um, I wouldn't say you know it's not the, my top priority, but I definitely like spice beers. I've brewed with spices, and um, hope you guys learned something today uh, talking about tinctures. Yeah, I feel like I say this more often than not, but uh, this is yet another topic that I just don't have that much experience in, at least uh, considering you know, how long I've been brewing. I personally prefer my spice to come from things like Noble Hops, uh, but I'll be honest, I've had a few spiced beers lately that I surprisingly enjoyed more than I thought, um, some of which I'm sure were made uh, with tinctures. Uh, I look forward to chatting about this and the fascinating experiment you performed, kid. So uh, if you're a fan of this show and you'd like to receive a reward for your support, consider becoming a patron of Brewlosophy over at patreon.com slash brewlosophy. By making a small monthly pledge, you'll receive rewards like access to unpublished contributor recipes, unique discounts at yakimavalleyhops.com, and an invitation to a monthly live Q&A session with somebody in the brewing world coming up in just a couple of weeks is host of the Sour Hour on the Brewing Network, Jay Goodwin, who's also from the Rare Barrel, one of the raddest sour beer breweries that I've ever been to. Jay's an absolutely incredible dude, a great brewer with a ton of knowledge. This is going to be an excellent session, no doubt. Past sessions have included folks like Mitch Steele, Mary Izette, John Palmer, and so many more. And all of those sessions are available on our private Facebook page, so you can watch them whenever you like. Learn more about becoming a patron over at patreon.com slash brewlosophy. And if you wouldn't mind letting us know what you think about this show by leaving a rating and a review in Apple Podcasts or wherever it is you listen to podcasts, we would really appreciate it. Feedback this week is brought to you by Brewers Hardware, who specialize in tri-clover compatible sanitary fittings, conical fer fermenters, kettles, and brew stands. Brewers Hardware offers a variety of unique items for home and craft brewers, including high-quality stainless fittings at great prices with super-fast shipping. Learn more at brewershardware.com. And don't forget to mention Brewlosophy at checkout to receive a free gift. Again, that's brewershardware.com. Peter Croff, I believe, it's K-R-O-G-H, had a comment about our recent Brews Views episode on evaluation and judging, which, Cade, you were with me on. That was episode 129. He said, one thing I don't think you touched on was that winning beers in competitions tend to be extreme examples of the style. For example, I know of a guy who won the pale ale category with a West Coast IPA recipe. It was even called Now That's an IPA. <laughs> After he won, he stated on a forum that he got the idea the year prior when he entered the same recipe in the IPA category and was told it wasn't hoppy enough. <laughs> you know, that's a really interesting comment. I would say yes and no, right? Uh, I have definitely been, I have a, a, some anecdotal experience myself. I've definitely been part of competitions where we've had a, a beer that I didn't feel like was to style that won a medal, um, uh, you know, the, the, or won even a gold, for example. Um, I know I entered a beer one time. Uh, I entered an IPA in a payload competition and got a gold medal. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, so something that I thought was totally 
out of style. But at the same time, I have seen plenty of beers, uh, you know, that are just straight down the line, you know, of great examples of styles, really well brewed and that come out with gold. An example of that is like a German pills. Yeah. I've seen several German pills it's, you know, I haven't ever seen a hoppy German pills win a German pills category, <laughs> um, you know, so, yeah. but so yes and no, I, I do. I do think that that's there. I think, um, I think though that people are trying, uh, you know, to get, you know, and it also depends on your judges too and where you're at and mm-hmm. what the competition is and where, you know, what flavors that particular geographic region likes. Yeah. So yeah, good feedback though. Yeah, no, I agree. And I think this idea uh, of entering, you know, kind of extreme caricatures of what the style is, it, you know, you take the style uh, guidelines and then you kind of amplify every major component of a style and you enter that. And the idea being that that's what's going to stand out to judges who are who are sampling, you know, eight to 12 beers. Uh, in their lineup. I get the concept. I, I know people who do the same exact thing as Peter's friend here. And, uh, you know, it, it, I think it works for some people, but like you said, Cade, that it's hard to predict what, uh, the judges on the specific panel that you're, you know, you're entering that they're going to be, or, you know, that, that is judging your beer, whether they are going to be looking more for the nuanced aspects of what we would determine to be the, you know, the, no, the normal style, or if they're going to be, uh, whether conscious or not, you know, paying more attention to those amplified aspects of it. It's a tough one, uh, but it is funny. And, and it is one of those things that I know a lot of people talk about. So thank you for the p- feedback, Peter. Uh, if you have show feedback, you can send it to feedback at brewlosophy.com or drop us a note on social media. So a couple weeks ago, I was kicking it with my buddy, Ryan Hansen, a local home brewer with a killer setup. This guy actually built a legit cold room into his garage where he keeps all kinds of commercial beer. There's his taps just tap right into the wall of the cold room. It's so cool. Well, Ryan tends to enjoy darker ales, as do I, uh, and mentioned that he had a crowler of Goo Goo Gaga from Arizona Wilderness Brewing Company. Uh, It was a beer that they made in collaboration with Magnanimous Brewing. Uh, This beer is described as being one part barley wine, two parts imperial stout, a triple mashed 24 hour boiled beer inspired by the Goo Goo Cluster from Nashville, Tennessee. That's a candy. Uh, After fermentation, a heavy dose of Nicaraguan. Uh, cacao nibs from Zach's uh, Zach's chocolate I guess that's a brand Uh, Madagascar vanilla beans and peanuts were added to mimic the historic candy Ryan let me take this crowler home to share with my friends one minute beer review with Jersey and Tim Jersey wake up oh my gosh I watched him pour this, and it and it poured out like it was not a liquid. It was like a. It was like a candy bar. It's between a liquid and a solid. It's it's it's, it's like motor oil, dude. It, you might have drained this out of a seventy-two Mustang and stiff. It would have been a Chevy, but whatever. Let's toast to, to motor oil. It's so good. Thick. Hang on, hang on. No, no, we like it. I like it. Do you like it? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's hard to drink. What? It's good. It's hard to drink. It's very strong. Do you like it? Yes, it's terrible. This is like 11.9. JTBVs. <laughs> Jer Tim by volumes. <laughs> you give it 11.9 JTBVs? Yeah. I'll give it 7.5 oh, JTBVs. you got to be way off. You think? Yeah. I like it. It's nice. You like it now? I said I liked it from the beginning. What is it, though? Is it? No idea. It's like cocoa. Is it a part? No, I don't think it is. It's warming my face. It's good. Uh, I think it's a barley wine. Yeah, maybe. Mm-hmm. It tastes like cocoa-ish. I think it's really good. It's good. We, we went off the Jersey Tims, and now we're on the JTBVs. You're at 11.9, and I'm at 7.5. It is 12%. Oh! I'm closest. Neither of us got it, so it's a wash. I'll go with eight. You're giving eight Tims? Yes. I give negative. What did Bloomberg spend? Negative 550 million Jerseys. This beer was thick. It was rich, and it tasted exactly like a candy bar. Now, what's funny is that Ryan told me that he actually picked this beer up for the guys because the promotional sign said, quote, for sophisticated palates only. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> that, that's funny i mean they definitely have have uh, improved their palates um and yeah i'd go ahead and call them sophisticated at hey. this point good job guys yeah they um, nailed they but, nailed it though i mean i mean they, totally. they nailed it it tasted like a candy bar in a glass uh you know arizona wilderness and magnanimous good job 12 percent when uh when uh, tim was guessing 11.9 percent i mean geez <laughs> yeah i don't know that i would be able to guess the abv of a beer just by taste uh so way to go tim but yeah, that's, I mean, that beer sounded really good. Uh, I kind of want to try it now. It's been a long time since I've tried a beer that was based off of a candy bar. Uh, maybe the next time I'm out and see one of those, I might give it a try. I'm telling you, it was it was way better than I expected. And the guys liked it way more. Ryan kind of thought it would be a funny one because he didn't think the guys were going to like it that much. Now, I'll be honest, when we got done recording that session... 
Tim gave me his glass because he was already pretty, if you couldn't tell, a little tipsy. And so he didn't want to drink anymore. But me and our friend Fade, another fighter pilot in Jersey, just split the rest of that crowler. And crowlers are big. And it was delicious. I mean, I really enjoyed it. Very, very sweet, as you might guess. And thick as motor oil. I mean, it was so rich, but very, uh, very good beer. I thought it fit in well with the uh, topic of this show because it it was quote unquote spiced, you know, with cacao nibs and vanilla and whatnot. And uh, yeah, I enjoyed it more than I thought. So thanks for the beer, Ryan. If you'd like to have your beer or any other fermented beverage you feel like sending into the show reviewed by Jersey and Tim, you can email me, marshallofphilosophy.com, and we'll get you all set up. We'll be right back after this break. This episode is brought to you by Milwaukee-based Spike Brewing, designer and manufacturer of premium quality homebrewing equipment. Whether you're interested in upgrading to a stainless steel fermenter like the incredible Flex Plus or switching to a turnkey electric setup so you can brew inside and avoid the cold, wet winter, Spike Brewing has the solution for you. Visit spikebrewing.com slash brewlosophy today and let their team help you figure out what you need to make the most of your brew day. Again, that's spikebrewing.com slash brewlosophy. Spike Brewing. Pursue what's possible. As every brewer knows, the best beer requires the best hops, which Yakima Valley Hops provides fresh from the source to brewers around the world, carrying everything from classics like Cascade to modern favorites like Galaxy and Mosaic, as well as other ingredients and gear, Yakima Valley Hops has it all. And don't forget to check out their new podcast, The Late Edition, where the YVH crew goes into depth on our favorite plant with industry experts. Head over to yakimavalleyhops.com now to see all they have to offer and subscribe to The Late Edition wherever it is you listen to podcasts. Craftmaster Growlers takes traveling with and sharing beer to a new level. Made from heavy-duty stainless steel, Craftmaster Growlers are double-wall insulated and can keep beer cold for up to eight hours. Unlike typical growlers, Craftmaster Growlers come with a swiveling tap and fully integrated CO2 regulator cap, allowing beer to stay fresh for two weeks or more. The square design takes up less space and will fit in most refrigerator doors, and every Craftmaster Growler comes with a one-year warranty. There are 64 and 128-ounce versions available over at craftmastergrowlers.com. Have you ever thought about adding a port to your kettle but held off because you didn't feel like drilling into your gear or sending it off to have someone else do it? From the makers of the world's fastest counterflow chiller, the Exchillerator, comes the Hangover. The easiest way to add extra ports to your kettle as well as countless other options. Mount a faucet to your keg for easy portable pouring. Set up the perfect whirlpool arm. Hold a heating element in place. All of this and so much more without permanently modifying your gear. Manufactured right here in the United States, The Hangover offers brewers too many convenient solutions to list here. So head over to Exchillerator.com today to see what The Hangover can do for you. I made my first technically spiced beer back in 2012. It was an amber ale inspired by Mac and Jack's African Amber, which I don't believe you can get anywhere outside of Washington State. Uh, I, I was a huge fan of this beer during college. It was it has this like curious orange note to it. At least back then, I thought it was amazing. I don't know what I would think today. Uh, but in my attempt to mimic this, I grated a bunch of orange zest and tossed it in during the last five minutes of the boil. Uh, that was the spicing that occurred. I, w- I wasn't using you know your typical spices. The beer ended up being okay. The orange was there, but it was very subtle. It wasn't until a local competition a few years later, one that required uh, the use of unique ingredients that I discovered and first used a tincture. Now, before we get too deep into talking about tinctures, let's talk a little bit more generally about using spices in beer. I know for me, when I hear the word spice, I, I immediately think of things like cinnamon, clove, nutmeg, etc. But at least in terms of brewing, spices include much more than that. Yeah, totally. Spices can include really a wide range of things. So, you know, I mean, uh, flowers, uh, roots, I mean, uh, you know, chocolate can be considered a, a, a you know, a spice, um, seeds, um, vegetables, ooh, uh, chili peppers, mm-hmm. you know, that's, that's some, that's one, you know, there's such a wide, wide range. And then, you know, spices can also be things that we would consider, you know, spices in cooking, cinnamon, vanilla, coriander, rosemary, basil, um, all that sort of stuff. You know, I mean, there's a wide range of things that you can do to beer when Whenever you want to add a spice to it and adding a spice to beer to me is just kind of like whenever you're cooking, you know, you've got this beer and you think, you know, hey, maybe I should. What if I, you know, I've got this great stout. What if I made it a little bit peppery or a mm-hmm. little bit hot? You know, I know we've all had um, 
it, well, I don't know that we've all had this, but one of the flavors that I really like um, is is that like chocolate with a little heat uh, oh, yeah. flavor, you know, so like a stout with a little bit of chili pepper or a little bit of cayenne pepper or cake, you know, we, we have that here too. Um, Mexican chocolate uh, here in Texas, which has got, it's not spicy, but it's just got a little bit of, you know, um, it's got a little bit of that character to yeah. the chocolate, a little bit of sharpness to the chocolate, which is really good. But that's what we're doing, right? I mean, we're adding those spices, uh, you know, to a beer, yeah. really any of those things. Well, and the beautiful thing about homebrewing is that uh, you can mess around without, uh, with minimal risk, we'll say. You might not like a batch, but it's only five gallons or less. Uh, you can toss it if you don't, you know, if you don't like it. Uh, th- now, there are certain styles of beer that are known to be traditionally spiced. Um, I, I immediately think of Belgian wit, um, you know, which you, you, automatically I think coriander uh, when it comes to Belgian wit. Uh, but there are some other uh, styles as well that I think traditionally had some spice to it. Uh, you, anything else you can think of uh, on that front? Oh, yeah, sure. You know, I mean, coriander, uh, wit beer being coriander and orange peel, uh, you know, that that orange peel character for, right. for a wit beer is also going to be super important. Um, which, you know, like I said earlier at the top of the show, pumpkin spice beers. I mean, that's not I don't know that that's necessarily a BJCP style, uh, but we certainly have a lot of them here in the United States uh, <laughs> yeah. in the fall. A, yeah, exactly. During a certain time of year, there seems to be everywhere. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, there's there's um, uh, I think it's St. Arnold's. Yeah, it is St. Arnold's that does a does an annual release of a beer called Pumpkinator, uh, which they, they sell in the big bomber bottles. And it's just got a lot of pumpkin, and a lot of pumpkin spice. Real L also does one, which is close down here. Uh, you know, and then, I mean, we've had vanilla stouts, uh, you know, I'm sure everybody's had a vanilla stout. Um, and then, you know, the, the, you know, going way back in history, this wouldn't be a spice episode if we didn't talk about what, what beer was before hops, right? I mean, Groot, Groot or grew it, however you want to say it. And that was entirely a beer uh, flavored with spices. I mean, you know, places that didn't have hops yet had were still making beer, and they were adding all kinds of different spices, like elderberry yeah. and, and whatever all kinds they of could stuff. find to balance the sweetness, right, of the uh, yeah. of the wort, basically. And that's it. That's the key, right there. I'm so glad that you said that. So to me, that's what we're doing with these spices. Um, is we're balancing. You know, we have hops in beer, but we're also balancing that sweetness. Uh, yeah. You know, for like pumpkin spice. Uh, when we're when we're balancing the sweetness of the pumpkin we're adding you know we're adding cinnamon which has got a little bit of a sweetness but we're also adding clove nutmeg uh you know and those things really balance out that sweetness of the beer and that's kind of what i like to think about whenever i'm adding spices to beer is how is this spice going to balance with the rest of it and there's our favorite beer brewing word right or beer tasting word is balance keeping everything in balance (laughs) that Um, term gets a lot of hate these days but i still think it works it, it, it matters to me <laughs> i love it i mean yeah. that's that's how i brew i mean every every recipe that i brew i'm thinking about balance and how does this taste you know yeah is this is this is the hop in relation to the malt all that stuff but that's yeah. a you know another topic maybe hey there's another bruise v- bruise views episode about <laughs> just balance on balance yeah yeah on well, balance. <laughs> like you mentioned though there it seems like today there are a lot of uh technically what would be what we would call a spiced beer uh i was over i was at uh, house of pendragon just yesterday and they have uh, ser- uh i think they call it seriously black it's this uh, an oatmeal stout, seven percent alcohol oatmeal stout that has cacao nibs and I believe coffee. That w- is technically a spiced beer, and uh, you know the way that those that a lot of these are being made. I think today is uh, that that the the brewers are adding directly the stuff that they're spicing the beer with. So, for example, I'm almost certain Tommy at House of Pendragon uses uh, uh, you know coffee grounds and and cacao nibs and tosses it in during fermentation. Um, you know, and then and it imparts that character very, very well. I think we've all probably attempted that, but there are other ways to impart spice character to beer as well. Yeah, I mean, there's all kinds of, you know, I mean, you can, there's spice extracts and, and things like that that you can buy at the homebrew store, you know. Um, one of the ones, everybody goes, everybody, I, I say spice ec- extracts and everybody goes, well, what do you mean? You know, isn't that just a, a tincture? Well, <laughs> well, yes, it is. But the, the biggest extract that a lot of people use, I mean, most people have it in their house right now, is vanilla extract, right? right? Vanilla is yeah. a spice. And you have that at home, most people do, right now in their pantry, uh, you know, so that is something that you can use to brew and just like you can buy a vanilla extract at the store you can buy spice extracts you can buy coriander extracts and things like that yeah. cinnamon extracts um all kinds of stuff orange extracts uh, lemon extract all that kind of you know those things that you can you know 
uh, that you can add to beer. All yeah. that stuff's available at your home brew store. So, um, so have you used extracts in your brewing before? Oh yeah, I I've used vanilla extract quite frequently. Um, so. The, probably my biggest brewing failure. Um, I got I got this itch. This was before I knew much about you know uh, a beer. I think it was like my fourth batch. You know, it's like the typical thing for new brewers to want to throw everything at their beer. Well, I had this idea to make. This is going to sound terrible to make a caramel apple amber ale. Okay, it was right around Halloween. I thought it would be kind of quirky and cool. And so my way of imparting this beer with caramel apple was to use like four pounds of caramel malt. And then uh, an apple, like an apple extract. Oh my God. <laughs> Don't ever do that. It was so bad. That sounds kind of so funny. Bad. You know, you, you should have done like just a cider, like a caramel apple cider. That would have been good. I, well, uh, I'm sure I've actually had a caramel apple cider that it was good. And if you think about yeah. it, I mean, this is, we're kind of going off, off the, uh, you know, the trail here, but uh, caramel, you know, you got diacetyl and then you got apple, which a lot of people think acetaldehyde kind of tastes like, like blend these two off flavors and make a beer out of it. It's a terrible idea. <laughs> yeah. But, but anyways, I did use extracts and I've also made I tried to make like an almond joy type of beer that didn't turn out very well using extracts. My experience with that just hasn't been very positive in the, uh, but it, it may be that I was just overusing the extracts uh, and, and that that character was so strong that it was, you know, uh, undesirable. It was just wasn't very good. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, it, it could be, you know, so I, another one that I brew, a beer that I brew every year, my wife loves it. I brew a chocolate pecan porter um, every winter. Um, and it's, it's, it's really good. It's eventually, eventually I dialed it in, but for that I used pecan extract, um, hmm. uh, whenever I'm doing it, whenever I'm adding it. And actually the first time that I used it, I added it in the keg. I put it in the keg, pressurized the keg, um, connected the CO2 on it. And then for whatever stupid reason, um, I pressed the, the gas poppet or not the, the liquid poppet on the keg and shot all of the spice, all of the extract tincture all over the roof of my garage. Oh God. <laughs> so there, my garage that, smelled dude. like, yeah, my garage smelled <laughs> like pecan. Um, but uh. anyway, you know, one of the things, one of the criticisms that I've heard about, um, uh, with using, uh, spice extracts, uh, is that there may be a little bit of, uh, sort of like harshness to mm -hmm. it or, or a little bit of, of maybe some alcohol character, a bite uh, to the extracts that you don't get uh, from commercial extracts that you don't get if you use if you do it at home using yeah. tinctures or if you uh, just direct pitch uh, the spices, uh, you know, into the beer. Uh, I have to I have to believe that the direct pitch thing is probably the most commonly used approach. And this is just you got something that you want, uh, you know, some spicing or, or whatever it might be, even nuts. Right. People are you could add pecans if you wanted to, though. I, I do think there are concerns some people have with adding certain uh, uh, products like nuts because of their oiliness and uh, the potential impact on head retention and whatnot. Um, and maybe extracts are easier uh, for certain things. But for the most part, when I'm reading about somebody making a, some form of a spiced beer, whether that's a, you know, a chocolate stout or a, or a coffee stout or something like that, it's usually they're, they're adding the product direct to the, the, either the boiling wort or, or during fermentation, kind of like a dry hop. Uh, and, and it works. I mean, it works really, really well. But there is another, uh, an alternative to that that I think is really cool. And I feel like it is more applicable perhaps because of scale uh, to home brewers. But I know that there are uh, professional brewers who are also using tinctures. Let's talk a little bit about what exactly a tincture is. Sure. Yeah. So a tincture to to me is an extract. It's a spice extract that we're getting um, using alcohol. Uh, so so uh, you know to me from the basic from a basic standpoint is you're s essentially steeping spices in alcohol and using the alcohol to extract out all of the flavors from the spices into a liquid that you can then strain out the spices and you have an alcohol liquid that you, then you can use to dose the beer um, so like like I said you know the vanilla extract that we all have at home depending on how it's made but a very common application is to do it um, in an alcohol you know, to use alcohol to extract it out and then remove the alcohol uh, for the vanilla for the vanilla extract. Um, but essentially, that's what we're doing is making our own homemade extract with spices. Uh, so, you know, putting the spice in a distilled spirit um, and we can talk about in a little bit, you know, what kind of spirit you want to use, but putting it in the spirit, letting it sit, letting all those flavors come out straining out the liquid and the, or straining out the spices from the liquid and then using that liquid to dose the beer. Yeah. Um, is that what you think about when you think about a, tin, a tincture? That is exactly, <clears throat> excuse me, that is exactly what a tincture is in my mind. And <clears throat> one of the cool things about 
a tincture is that you do have a little bit of room to play, like you mentioned, with the type of spirit you're using. Now, when it comes to making tinctures, I've heard you want a spirit that's at least 80 proof, so about 40% alcohol. But you can go, I mean, I know people who are making tinctures with Everclear um, and, and using that. The idea, again, you want that alcohol to extract the flavors from whatever it is you're putting in there. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, the I've I've always used a, a sort of a neutral spirit too. You know, like vodka or grain alcohol. I mean, yeah. I've used grain alcohol Everclear uh, yeah. before to do it. Uh, you know, the the idea is, yeah, you need high enough alcohol that you're actually going to be able to pull out the uh, flavor components uh, yeah. from 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 the beer or, or you know from the the the, the spices. Uh, yeah. So you know. There's uh, here's a, an interesting one, too, um, that some people have talked about before is is, uh, you know, should you use vodka grain alcohol or could you use, you know, something that's got more flavor like bourbon um, or, uh, you know, some other uh, more flavorful. Like what if you used a peach vodka uh, to pull out or something instead of, you huh. know, just like a regular vodka to add, you know, maybe a little bit of peach subtlety. Have yeah. you ever have you ever tried to use anything other than vodka or grain alcohol? The uh, so we'll get into talking about some of the the neat things uh, you can use tinctures for. But I one time did, I just had some oak lying around. And so, you know, oak, uh, it, you, I consider a spicing. It's something that you use to kind of amplify certain characteristics and flavors in beer. And so I tossed some oak into some, uh, I think it was scotch. I don't know if I had bourbon, um, but it was, you know, a, a kind of a, a nice scotch, decent scotch and let it soak for a week or so. And then I, I was taking drops of that and adding it to glasses of, uh, I think it was a brown ale that I had on tap and mm. just kind of tasting you know, and it, 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 it absolutely in my mind tasted more like a, uh, you know, like a barrel aged closer to a barrel aged amber ale. I was kind of going for like a double a DBA. Firestone Walker has their DBA mm -hmm. trying to see if I can kind of match that character with the tincture. Uh, but yeah, so that you can absolutely do that. But let's talk a little bit about how tinctures are made. Uh, sure. Most yeah. of them are like a one pint, you know, mason jar. And I'm just not sure, even if you, when you strain out all of this, whatever it is that you're making the tincture of, if you add all of that to a beer, you're really not even bumping up the ABV very much. And I'm just not sure that small amount uh, for like a five gallon batch is enough to, ha to really have an impact on, it, I'm talking about the spirit. Obviously the tincture part, you, you can taste it if you use it properly, if you make a proper tincture. Um, I'm, I'm not, I don't know if like, if I had added that pint of, uh, of, uh, you know, scotch that had been soaking in wood chips. I don't know if I would have tasted much more of the scotch. Uh, definitely the wood, that wood character was so strong. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I think it also sort of depends on the amount of spice that you're using. Right. So like, you know, you know, for like a, a whip beer, if I'm using coriander and orange peel, I'm not using a whole lot of those spices. You no. know, that's also the good thing about spices is they go a long way. You don't have to use a lot of spice whenever you're adding spices to beer. Right. Um, and especially if you're using tincture, you get a lot of flavor out of that, out of that, um, out of the spices in the liquid that you're actually pouring into the beer. Uh, so, so, you know, when it depends on the spices for me. So like if I'm if I'm brewing a whip beer, um, uh, for example, I might only use three or four ounces of alcohol, um, you know, of vodka or, you know, uh, Everclear grain alcohol uh, in the tincture. And so adding three or four ounces to the beer in a five and a half gallon batch, that's, that's nothing. I mean, yeah. I, that's probably less than 1% of the beer. So I can't imagine that you're going to get much flavor from the actual alcohol, um, that you're adding the yeah. spices again, have those super sensitive flavor components that we're very attuned to and very sensitive to. Mm -hmm. And that's why it comes through in the beer. I'm not sure if we used, you know, like say bourbon, uh, to pull vanilla, uh, out of a vanilla bean or something and you only used a couple of ounces of that that you would actually get bourbon character in the at the end of the beer uh, right. but you know I mean who knows it's always something it's always something to 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 do uh, but that raises one thing that I wanted to talk about too is is how much uh, people always ask how much you know distilled spirit do you have to use do I have to use a whole bottle of grain of you know of grain alcohol whenever yeah. I'm making a tincture and the answer to that at least in my experience is no you really don't I mean the you really only need as far as what I do in my process and there's variability on this everybody disagrees but in my process 
I just add enough alcohol to sort of cover the spices. Yep. And remember that some of the spices actually will expand um, whenever they're rehydrated. Uh, but, you know, so just enough to make sure that the spices are covered. And then that's yeah. really it. You know, so if I'm only using a couple of, you know, like a tablespoon or, or two total of spices, that's going to be to me, you know, two ounces, maybe four ounces of, of uh, spirit. And that's just, yeah. you know, not very much at all yeah. uh, in terms of liquid. I agree. So the um, a question that I've actually been emailed a few times is, you know, I want to make this spiced beer, whatever it might be. Uh, how much, you know, how much of the spice do I use and how much spirit do I use uh, for the tincture and da da da? Well, the the cool thing about tinctures is once once the tincture is made, you get to taste it and sample it in in a small amount of beer. And then you kind of get to determine how much you want to add to the beer from there to see how, you know, how powerful or potent this tincture actually is. Now, obviously, if you take uh, the same six ounces of a, of a, let's say, vodka and you add, you know, two, uh, you know, two kernels of, uh, of coriander and, you know, four bits of bitter orange peel to one and then the other one you add a handful of both. Yes, you're going to extract more character from the one that you add a handful of. But in general, in my experience, uh, it really is like you said, you add, you know, what, what I would do is use the amount of uh, spice that's called for in whatever recipe you're brewing and then just make the tincture with that amount. And like you said, just make sure it's covered uh, and, and that you cover it with enough to, uh, you know, account for any any um, that kind of sometimes it absorbs that uh, alcohol and gets a little bit bigger. Um, so yeah. make sure you just keep it covered and then you let it sit. How long do you usually let your tincture sit for? Oh, this is a, this is the question that I I do not have a good answer to. <laughs> um, uh, I I can tell you what I do uh, usually whenever I'm I'm letting my tincture sit, and then I can tell you what, having done a lot of research on this all over the place, uh, uh, having done a lot of research on this. It's all over the place about how long you can let this sit. I usually let my tincture set between 40, 48 hours and four days. So two days to four days is usually what I let it sit. But there's um, there's stuff out there that says you can let tincture set for 30 minutes and that the full extraction is done in 30 minutes. And then yeah. there are places that say you need to let it set six weeks or months before you actually get the full extraction um, yeah. you know, out of this stuff. So it is all over the place. But I can tell you, for me... I have, I don't think I've ever let a tincture sit six weeks, so I probably can't say that I wouldn't, you know, that there's no difference in character, but I know that after, uh, after two days of, of the tincture, I know I've got plenty of the character that I'm looking for whenever yeah, I'm pitching. Yeah, I, I, I've, I've read the same thing, that you can actually just, it, like, half an hour is good enough. It's almost kind of like uh, marinating something, you know? Um, but I tend to make tinctures. When, in the few times that I've made a tincture, uh, what I've done is I make it on brew day, and then I just let it sit until I want to add it, whether that's, you know, tail end of fermentation or whatever. And again, with tinctures, uh, to me, one of the more cool, the cooler things that you can do with a tincture is mess around with individual glasses of beer. So you take your unadulterated normal beer, whatever style it might be, and then you use a dropper and you add, you know, amounts of whatever tincture it is and have fun kind of, you know, uh, changing this beer on a, on a glass by glass basis. Uh, that's one thing you can do with tinctures. And again, I think that's kind of fun, but there's also, uh, the, you can also add the tincture to the entire batch. Uh, and which is what you have, I think a little bit more experience doing because the tinctures that I've made with one exception have always been to mess around, uh, with uh, glass by glass. Well, yeah, you, you, but you, you bring that up, messing around glass by glass. Uh, but that's actually how I determined the amount of tincture to add to the full batch. Right. Right. So so I so this is this to me is the big difference between adding a tincture versus direct pitching a spice. Right. If is the 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 speed with which you can determine the exact amount that you want to add in order to get the flavor that you want. Um, so an easy way to figure out what kind of how much, you know, this is the other question. How much spice do I add, uh, you know, to the beer or to the tincture? And the easiest way you can do that is just like what you said, brew a batch without the spice. And then once it's done, once it's fermented, make your tincture um, and add droplets, you know, using an eyedropper, using a syringe or, you know, measuring spoons, whatever you want to do, add it to it and then get it to the level of taste that you like. And once you found out, okay, in a 16 ounce or, you know, um, in a, I, I like to use metric conversions here cause it's just much easier, you yeah. know, <laughs> you know, in, in, in like a half liter or in a, you know, uh, yeah, a half liter glass of, you know, fill that up and then add your, 
spice tincture to it and then you can figure out okay well i have a half a liter here or 16 ounces and then you can figure out exactly how much you need to add to the whole batch so the next time that you brew you can just add you can get the tincture ready have the volume that you need the amount of spices that you need dump it in and then there you go now you've got the whole batch and you don't have to worry about adding to individual glasses yeah. or pitchers or or anything like that but that's to me the difference between doing a tincture and doing direct pitch so if i'm just direct Directly pitching the spices into the beer, for example, I don't know what that final character is going to be like until several days later, or you know, you know, maybe even I guess you could say thirty minutes, sixty minutes, something like that later, but a, a, quite a bit of time later. And then what happens whenever you add too much? Right. Yeah. If I put too much coriander in or too much orange peel, and I don't know about it until my full batch is ruined, <laughs> then it's you know crap yeah, <laughs> you know then i gotta dump this whole thing <laughs> yeah uh you know and, and so i think that's where that's a big benefit of of tincture versus using um direct pitch yeah the um the the direct so i've i'm gonna the first time i ever did a tincture uh for a full batch uh i'm gonna story time here uh so I had, there was a challenge in our homebrew club, our local homebrew club, where we, every, I think they're still doing this to this day. I just don't, con, you know, con, participate because I'm not big on competitions, as we discussed in a past episode. Uh, <laughs> but I was involved in this one competition, and basically what you do is every quarter, uh, all the club members uh, have a very specific style of beer that you're supposed to make, and then those go on to get judged, and the person who gets the most points throughout the year wins, you know, uh, the annual award for that. Well, uh, one of the, this, this particular year, I think it was 2012, uh, one of the, uh, the 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 beers that we had to brew was a you know spiced had to be something unique and weird and and whatnot and I had the idea I don't know if you remember these Kate I know you're a little younger than me but there's those popsicles they look like rocket pops but instead of being the red white and blue they're like pudding pops with banana and chocolate oh yeah um, I remember those yeah, I forget for sure. what they're called but they yeah. were my favorite growing up so I had this <laughs> idea to make. I, that turn that into a beer. And so, you know, in my head, I'm kind of formulating this idea. I thought, well, I'll make like a Dunkelweiss, uh, ferment it nice and warm to get that banana character out of that yeast, and then add the cacao nibs and vanilla beans. But how do I want to add that? Well, this is when I learned about tinctures, was kind of researching the best way to get that characteristic in there. And so I made a tincture with cacao nibs in a, I had a, a one pint mason jar, filled that thing, you put like, I probably put like three or four ounces of cacao, cacao nibs in the jar, cut up two or three vanilla beans, which was a lot, but I really wanted that. I want it to be kind of dessert flavored, uh, tossed in some vodka, let it sit for four or five days. And then I just went, I, I didn't do the, the graduated dosing or anything like that. I just poured that entire tincture, uh, liquid into the beer when there was like two days left of fermentation. I'll tell you what, it took first place in the competition. It tasted exact. I called it Coco Nanilla because uh, nice. it had this kind of chocolate, banana, vanilla thing going on that tasted like the ice cream. Uh, and I thought it was pretty cool. But the tincture worked amazingly well. That's that that beer sounds really good. And actually, it was disgusting, me... kid. I hated oh. it, but it won the yeah. award. And <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it sounds good. I like the idea behind it. I, w I would probably try it. Uh, but now you've got me thinking about rocket pops. I haven't had one of those in years, but hey, they're good. <laughs> uh, but, but anyway, back to back to, you know, to, to tinctures and stuff. But yeah, I mean, um, you know, that also is is something to, you know, you just added the whole, you know, the whole thing in there, uh, you know, without tasting it or doing it. You can also do that if you've got a recipe that you found or that somebody gave you and it says this is the amount of spices to use. You don't have to, you know, individually dose. You can just dump it in. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, but you know, one of the things too, that people always talked about, um, with you, with, um, you know, tinctures versus a direct pitch is, are you going to get any other additional character from the beer, from the spices whenever you direct pitch them? Meaning are you going to get any sort of harshness or, yeah. or bitter flavors from the spiciness uh, or from, from the spices whenever you direct pitch them? Uh, and some people saying that the alcohol sweetness of the tincture sort of reduces, um, you know, the, the, the flavor of those yeah. harshness uh, or, you know, the harsh characters of it. I don't know that I ever really necessarily agreed with that. Uh, but, I've generally, uh, I've used a lot of tinctures. I've equally used a lot of um, direct 
pitching, mainly just because I don't keep a lot of grain alcohol or vodka around the house. I mostly just drink beer and wine. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm boring. But anyway, uh, but yeah, so, you know, I mean, I've done quite a bit of those and uh, was kind of interested, you know, to see what would yeah. happen if we uh, if we ran this direct pitch versus a tincture um, and see what happened. Absolutely. And that's the experiment that we're going to be discussing when we return from this break. The brew in a bag method is blown up over the last few years, and in that time, it's become very clear that not all bags are created equal. For the best BIAV experience, you have got to go with the brew bag. Made from high-quality, food-safe polyester, the brew bag is available in both 210 micron for standard brew in a bag, as well as 400 micron, which works beautifully for all-in-one recirculating systems. I've been a brew bag user for years and wouldn't brew without it. Head over to brewinabag.com to get the fabric filter that works for you and use promo code TBP17 at check out to receive a discount. Again, that's brewinabag.com. After a long brew day, the last thing I want to do is waste more time chilling wort. I've tried so many different options, and ultimately, I settled on the super efficient immersion chillers made by Jaded Brewing. With the King Cobra and Hydra, I'm able to chill my entire batch of wort from boiling to just a few degrees above groundwater temperature in as little as six minutes. If an immersion chiller is right for your brewery, then do yourself a favor and check out all of the rad options Jaded Brewing has to offer at jadedbrewing.com. And be sure to let them know Brewlosophy sent you. Compact and simple to use with a small footprint for brewing indoors, the Grainfather makes it easy for you to brew professional quality beers at home. The Grainfather is an all-in-one brewing system that lets you brew all-grain beer in a single, compact stainless steel unit. It uses an electric heating element and pump to maintain a constant temperature and to circulate the wort during the mashing and cooling stages. It also comes with a counterflow chiller to reduce chilling times and produce high-quality wort. And now, with the addition of their conical fermenter, the Grainfather takes things one step further by offering homebrewers state-of-the-art temperature-controlled fermentation just like commercial breweries use. And with the Grainfather Recipe Creator and Connect app, you can easily design a recipe, sync your brewing system with your phone, and then just sit back and relax as the app takes over and assures that you maintain your scheduled mash temps and boil schedule. Head to grainfather.com to purchase your all-in-one brewing system today and to sign up for their free recipe creator tool. Once more, head on over to grainfather.com, that's grainfather.com, and get started today. Family-owned Atlantic Brew Supplies, the largest homebrew shop in the Southeast. No gimmicks, no multinational corporate overlords, and no BS. They offer exclusive malts, yeast, and more from local artisans, as well as award-winning recipe kits. They also sell professional brewing gear and cask equipment from sister companies ABS Commercial and Cask Supply. Most ingredients are available by the ounce, plus Atlantic Brew Supply has an on-site calculator to help you craft your best brew. Orders are processed same day, and two-day shipping is guaranteed for East Coast customers. Get 15% off your first order using promo code. BrewPod. That's B R U P O D at AtlanticBrewSupply.com. I may not make much spiced beer, but I was definitely interested when you proposed an experiment comparing beers that were where spices were added uh, either directly or via tincture. Uh, Tell us about it, Cade. Yeah. So again, I wanted to see how this would work, adding directly uh, spices during fermentation versus doing it during a tincture or uh, using a tincture. Um, So I uh, decided to use a very traditional um, style of beer that has spices, which is wit beer. Um, so I brewed a single 10 gallon batch of wit beer. Uh, the malt recipe, the malt was super, um, super simple, just 50% pale malt and 50% wheat malt. Um, nothing too complicated there. Uh, mashed at 149, uh, which 149 F, which is 65 Celsius, uh, for 60 minutes, uh, boiled the beer for 60 minutes. I uh, wanted to add just a little bit of bitterness, um, not a whole lot of hop character like most Belgian styles. So 28 grams of tetanang at 60 minutes, and then another 15 grams, uh, of tetanang at five minutes. Um, 
after boil, uh, warts were chilled and uh, took a uh, refractometer reading and got, a, I, actually it was, a, sorry, a hydrometer reading and got an OG of 1.038, uh, which is a little low for a wit beer, but nothing to frown at. Um, so then uh, chilled everything down, evenly split the wort between two beer, two brew buckets and pitched a pouch of Imperial Yeast B44 Whiteout into each one, which have you ever brewed with Whiteout? I have not. I don't. I, to be honest with you, uh, uh, this is another. I, I, I don't hate on people who like styles I don't like. I'm not a big fan of wit beer. I really the, the coriander flavor doesn't sit with me very well. Um, yeah. But so I've never used white out. But I am kind of going through and trying to brew every uh, style short and shoddy at some point. And so I'm going to have to get to it. Oh, yeah. I, I liked white out a lot. It's a very flavorful, very characterful yeast. Um, a little bit, I would say a little bit more so than some of the other yeast, uh, the other Belgian wit beer strains that that mm. I've used before. Uh, but very nice, uh, very pleasant, uh, adds those nice phenolics that you're looking for in a Belgian beer. Yeah. Um, and, and I think it went really well um, with the spices in this beer. Um, so I fermented uh, the beers in each brew bucket at 68F or 20C. And this is where we sort of get to the variable. So a tincture, uh, like I said, my process is to let it set from between two to four days. Uh, so in this case, after three days of into fermentation, I made the tincture. Uh, I used vodka. Uh, and I measured out my coriander, bitter orange peel, and I had actually added some white peppercorns uh, in it as well. Uh, I find that I like the way that the peppercorns play in a wit beer, but mm. that's just me. Um, so I added uh, those to a jar, then covered it with vodka. I think I used right at like three ounces of vodka. I think if you look at the picture on the website, you can see the three little, you know, uh, taster bottles, uh, you know, the, the airplane <laughs> bottles <laughs> of vodka, uh, added those to a jar and then just let it sit for four days. Uh, uh, after four days, I would notice that the fermentation activity was slowing down. Uh, so it's a good time to pitch at that point. Uh, so I used a, uh, strainer to separate the liquid, a sanitized strainer, uh, to separate the spices from the tincture and then measured out my dry spices, uh, which is just the direct pitch. Uh, by the way, wanted to use the same quantities of spice in this experiment. So didn't right, want there right. to be any difference based on, uh, you know, saying that, that uh, like strength or concentration of the tincture. I wanted the yeah. spices to be the same, uh, which I think is, is my understanding from using tinctures over the year and also what I've read and researched is that, again, that's what determines your flavor addition. Uh, as long as you're not using too much of the alcohol or grain, uh, right. that the spices is where you're actually going to get your flavor component. So just wanted to mention that. But, uh, so then I, uh, so that was after a total of seven days. So three days made the tincture, let the tincture sit for four days. Uh, so after a total of seven days fermenting, I added both, uh, or I added the direct pitch to one batch and then added the tincture, uh, to the other batch. Yeah. That, so, so the idea here being that you wanted the, that you wanted the time of <laughs> the time of addition to be uh, equal between the two. Uh, the, the one thing you had to calculate. So now you've got this one beer that has, uh, al you know, uh, uh, spicy alcohol, if you will, added to it. You got the other one that has the spices still in it um, that you are going to leave behind when you package those beers. Yeah, exactly. Now, one thing I would have done differently, uh, not not from an experiment standpoint, just for future using um, direct spices, and I did it intentionally on this experiment, is normally I would add the spices using a, uh, a bag, like a grain bag or something, a hot bag, uh, so that the spices sort of don't drop to the bottom of the fermenter. Uh, I wanted to leave them open here because I you know, there's a lot of people that say that you know, you're not getting full extraction and we let the spices sit in alcohol so we've got full extraction theoretically yeah. over that four days. I didn't want there to be any issues about the bag restricting the amount of spices that came mm -hmm. in. So for this experiment, I didn't use a bag, but I generally, whenever I add spices directly, I do use a bag. Uh, so just wanted to kind of point that out for anybody that cares <laughs> yeah yeah so you you let those spices mingle with the beer for four days though yep let the let the spices mingle for four days and uh at that point fermentation activity it seemed to stop uh took a hydrometer measurement and showed that both of the beers had to hit the exact same fg which is that nice low belgian dry 1.003 um uh, which was great 
then I, uh, so I, real quick right here, even though we added alcohol, um, to the beer and maybe some, you know, sweetness or something that was in that alcohol, we didn't notice, I didn't notice any difference, uh, in the final gravity. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's interesting. Right. Um, and it, I, I would have expected, uh, maybe a little bit different though. The amount of alcohol, I mean, three ounces, like I said before, you're probably, the, the idea would be that hopefully you don't taste it either. Uh, we'll get to that in a minute though. Yeah, exactly. So I actually did the calculation three ounces of, uh, in a five and a half gallon batch is less than 1% of the yeah. beer. Uh, so yeah. yeah, so I can't imagine that it had any significant impact in terms of the actual alcohol content in the beer. Right. Uh, so then I followed my normal process, uh, racked the beer over to purged and sanitized kegs, uh, burst carbonated them in the keezer and let them condition for a week uh, before serving to tasters. Which is the fun part of every experiment. Uh, <laughs> it is. Before, it is we, <laughs> before we get to how well they did, at this point, give us your impressions. I mean, what were you thinking uh, when, you know, when you pulled those first couple of, of pints to sample yourself. So, I mean, those beers were, it were identical. Uh, you know, I mean, I poured them into the brewlosophy glasses and, and, you know, um, the picture on the website doesn't do it justice. I think there's just a shadow over one of the glasses, but those beers sure. looked, looked identical. Uh, whenever I poured them, they both poured well, had the same head retention, same, same aromatics, um, you know, and then, of course, I start tasting them and going, well, crap, <laughs> I can't taste the difference between these. Um, That's, I, 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 honestly, even as a person who doesn't do much spiced beer, uh, the fact that the tincture didn't taste different to you as even being, you know, uh, totally aware of what was going on. I, I expected this one to the beers to taste differently. I really did. Uh, just because the, the method, the difference in methods really do seem like they would you know, impart, uh, just unique differences. And yeah, you, you, you said that you did two, uh, or that you did four triangle tests completely knowing everything about this and had to completely guess and only got two out of the four, right. Uh, because yeah. the beers tasted so similar, right? Yeah, exactly. I always love this too. It's like, Oh wait, but I got 50% right. Yeah. But all right, let's be honest. I was totally guessing. <laughs> so like, like, I, like that was just, that was one of those where just, so, so, I don't know this one. And, and you happen to be right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, those, those beers were to me, uh, completely identical. I could not, um, uh, taste any difference between them, but wow. that's why we, uh, serve them to tasters. So, that's right. so, uh, took it to a zealots homebrew club meeting. Um, and we had 30 participants for this one which is a great sample size, uh, given 30 per participants, uh, expected to have 15, uh, guess cor or answer correctly, uh, in order to reach significance, but we only had 10. So not significant. Yeah, it's exactly one third. So 33.3%. Uh, you, that is exactly what you would expect in random guessing, which really does, uh, kind of tell us that these beers, at least with that tasting panel and the way that you brewed these beers were, uh, arguably indistinguishable. Which is crazy. That would mean, I mean, not, I, I, that means that you've got uh, uh, you, uh, the opportunity, all right, to add spices directly to your beer, or you can use tinctures in, how, in whatever capacity you want to. And it seems that what these results kind of seem to say is that you're going to get the same characteristics imparted in the beer, which I think is really cool uh, for people who may not want to make, maybe they want to make a whipped beer without all the spices and let, pe let the people who are drinking that beer, you know, dose their own glasses. Well, it could be that you're, you know, you're not imparting any negative characteristics. The alcohol didn't come through. Uh, super cool in my book. Yeah, this one was really interesting to me, too, because, I, you know, I, and I, I admittedly we can be wrong about assumptions that we make. I assumed that the alcohol was going to add something right, that the tincture was going to add some sort of flavor yeah. to the beer that that did, wasn't there in the other beer. You know, I mean, adding less than one percent of the, you know, of the volume of the beer. Looking back, I should have I should have, you know, probably looked at that and gone, wait, why would that add any flavor? There's no <laughs> way I'm going to be able to, to, to taste that. Yeah. Um, but, you know, something about like okay well i can taste the spices whenever i add the tincture so surely there's going to be something else that, that happens but right. no uh it couldn't taste any difference and to me this one was really validating because this means that um to me and when i'm brewing in my process once i've got the spice amounts dialed in to a beer i'll probably continue to use tinctures for dialing in the spice amounts but once yeah. i've got the spice amounts added i'm not gonna i'm not gonna you know, do the additional step of making a, a, a tincture. I'm just going to add the spices directly to the beer. Now, caveat, 
on that these spices so the orange peel coriander and peppercorns there you know that's the, those were the spices that i used in this batch there could be differences from other you know spices that you use i you know i don't know that that uh you know lavender or lemongrass or those kinds of things Although I have made tinctures of both of those and they came out well, you yeah. know, I don't know that that's going to taste different. So you can always look back at this and go, well, OK, that's limited just to these spices. I would say anecdotally about that. It, it seems to me that every time I've added a tincture, I haven't added any additional alcohol flavor or harshness or bitterness or anything like that, especially not as compared to you know, adding spices at the boil or something yeah. like that. I think that's where you can get really dangerous into some really dangerous territory, getting soapy flavors or harshness or, or things like that. But that's what I've read. And that, and that would be an interesting experiment on its own, right? Is uh, adding spices to the boil versus, uh, you know, during to the beer during fermentation or whatever. Yeah. Um, but, but it is interesting to me because um, I thought of this in the same way that, there, you know, there's these claims out there that adding, using spices and adding them directly, you can impart, you know, uh, har- harshness, uh, you know, uh, what, cause that's for the tannin, you know, going to leach out and all this. And the fact that these beers tasted so similar and that only one third of 30 people were able, you know, just guessed, happened to guess the, the odd one out, I think is really cool. And, and, and again, tells us if you want to just add spices directly, you're probably not going to ruin a batch of beer. Yeah, I really like the I, I really like the result of this, you know, because uh, I mean it, it's just, it's kind of you know do what you want. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, yeah. I kind of I love those results whenever that whenever it happens. It's not, you know, of course nothing that we do is prescriptive, but uh, you know this one seems to me to hey yeah they both taste the same. So do what you want. If you want to add the tincture and that's your process, go for it. If you want to add direct pitch of spices, you know all power to you. Yeah, exactly. And and I, you know, before we get to some reader comments, uh, for those for those people out there who are making a lot of spiced beers or who like to experiment, I do really think it's cool. You know, the idea of keeping a bunch of different spice tinctures around, like lined up on a shelf, and then playing with those and blending the different spice tinctures with certain types of beers. Uh, I just think it's super cool. So uh, if you're you know if you're into the spice beer, consider making some tinctures for your glass to glass, or like Cade said, if you want to just toss those spices directly into the beer, you can do that as well. It seems. All right, yeah. reader comments. We uh, first. This one comes from Reddit user Kung Fu Hippie. <laughs> These people are name. so clever with their names. <laughs> the reason behind tinctures for me is that it allows you to experiment with a glass of beer, okay, and confirm exactly how much is needed, especially with spices like clove or additions like coffee that can easily overpower the beer if used too aggressively. But a good thing, according to this experiment, is that once you've dialed in your recipe, you might be able to skip the tincture step and go right to dumping the spices in. Hey, there we go. I think that's exactly yeah, what I was just saying. You can, um, you know, you may be able to skip adding a tincture once you've dialed in your recipe. And that sounds just like what I would consider my process uh, for adding spices is using the tincture to be able, in, a, in a final beer to be able to figure out what spice level I like. Yeah, and I do get what uh, Kung Fu Hippie here is saying, right? That that the beauty of the tincture is that it allows you to determine on a smaller level what you eventually want to do on the bigger scale, right? So so you you got this tincture, you you dose a certain you know specific amount and a specific volume of beer, you determine what you like, what flavors uh, you're going for there, uh, and th- and then you extrapolate from there and and know what to do to the larger batch. At the same time, you can use tinctures in the larger batch of beer as well. Um, it, it is kind of, there has to be some, I guess, presumption or guessing that goes into this, this concept of, well, once I've determined how much of a tincture I like in a beer, then I can just take that amount of spices and add it directly to the beer. Again, this experiment does seem like like Kung Fu Hippie said, it does seem to say that the tincture versus the direct may not be that big of a difference. But I would have I'd struggle personally to determine, you know, how much direct spices to use uh, just based on how much tincture I used in a sample. Am I making any sense at all when I say that? Yeah. Yeah. Well, like what's the concentration of the tincture? Right. You know, right, versus. Yeah. yeah. Especially if you're just kind of pouring enough to cover the spices, you know, if you're not like exactly. measuring it out, um, you know, I, I will say that that. Uh, my own anecdotal experience is that you know, I, I've never actually d- like tried to calculate the concentration of the tincture. Um, I've always just sort of equally used the direct spices versus the tincture uh, versus the amount of spices that I used in the tincture. And I've always right. had consistent results. That's me yeah. anecdotally. I'm sure that there's somebody out there that has done this or or would be interested in doing this. So if you get different uh, results from that, just shoot me an email. I'd love to hear about it. 
Yeah, yeah, no. Uh, so next comment, this is a good one. Uh, Felix Brewer says, I've experimented with a lot of spices and would say that, that some work well in tinctures. And he says coffee, vanilla beans, oak chips, cacao nibs, and cinnamon, while others are better when added fresh to the beer. He says like fr- fruit purees. Uh, but if I don't know the flavor profile of the addition, I make a tincture first because it's easier to test out. Yet again, another person talking about the the use of tinctures as a way to test, uh, uh, you know, c- t- see how that characteristic is is going to play in the beer. Again, I think that's a very important thing about tinctures. But at the same time, I was wondering, are there certain things like coffee and vanilla beans that maybe work better with a tincture while other things don't? A a fruit puree tincture, I'd never even really considered that. I mean, I could see maybe using like dried fruits to make a tincture out of and and that being a very, a a way to get a really pungent uh, fruit characteristic. I didn't, I don't even know if people are making tinctures with fresh fruits. I mean, yeah, that's something I haven't ever really considered. Um, I always just, when I'm doing fruit additions, just direct pitch the fruit. Right, um, me too. Yeah, uh, but, you know, interesting. I, I, I'd also be interested to see how much fruit character you'd get in the tincture, you know. Um, I know. It, 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 like, it seems to me like if, if I added, uh, you know, oh, I don't know, like raspberries or something. So if, let's say that I added like a half pound of raspberries or something to a beer, but I used uh, that same half pound of raspberries in a tincture, would I get the same character? Um, I don't know. That's interesting. I know. I know it would be. Inter- I mean, I think of things like, I mean, you used bitter orange peel. That's common. That's a fruit uh, yep. and, and commonly used in tinctures because it is dried and uh, that tincture will extract a lot of orange character when you do that. Anybody who's made a tincture with bitter orange pill knows that very well. Um, so I could see, you know, I guess there would be some fruits, but I like what he's saying that there probably are certain things that do tend to fare better when used in a tincture versus added directly and vice versa. Um, mm. Something to test out, you know, for those who want to uh, mess around with spice in their beers. Yeah. Uh, Reddit user, Mr. Mick Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Another good name. You guys are on point with These the names. <laughs> I know. says the issue with using spices in the boil is largely tannin extraction so again your experiment you didn't uh add spices to the boil i don't believe uh but mr mcawesome says neither coriander nor peppercorns are particularly high in tannins so these results aren't particularly useful the experiment should be redone with something like cinnamon sticks yeah i I didn't add any spices in the boil um on this one this was purely uh adding it at fermentation and and towards the end of fermentation so i'm not um I, i I will say having added spices to the boil before I, that seems consistent with what I've, uh, I've, uh, my own anecdotal experience, depending on when and how long you boil them. Uh, although I would say, you know, yeah. if I'm, if, you know, for example, I've used, I, I, I make, um, uh, a lavender whip beer as well uh, for the summer, which is a great spritzy summer beer. Um, and, that when I'm using that lavender, I've found that if I let that thing go in the boil for more than a minute, I mean, honestly, I'm probably just going to start doing it at Whirlpool instead of even putting it in the boil at all, um, is that when I do that, that lavender can impart what I would consider like a soapy character. Yes. Um, I've tasted that before. Yeah. And, and it's really strong and it comes out really quickly. So if, if I, if I let that sit at high temperatures for too long, like for example, I've added lavender at 10 minutes at five minutes at one minute and those 10 minute additions of lavender don't turn out well in my grandma's experience. perfume closet, right? Yeah. yeah, <laughs> that's, what yeah. It's, that's what it smells like to me. Yeah, exactly. You know, like I said, again, though, this experiment didn't have anything to do with the boil. I do think that that would be a good experiment for the future. Is yes. to see about boil versus a fermentation addition. Right. Well, or uh, like like uh, Mr. McAwesome here is saying, use something that's known to be higher in tannins like cinnamon. Uh, and it, of course, it would have to be real cinnamon, not that fake stuff. Uh, <laughs> but but to, to because I feel like the and we're, we're again, we're getting a little off off of the topic here. But but there is a lot of talk about tannins in brewing. And we've done a lot of experiments trying to uh, extract tannins in, in the traditional ways. And we just can't seem to do it. I, I like the idea of testing out, you know, does adding a cinnamon stick at 10 minutes in the boil versus in the whirlpool or during fermentation have it, will the perceptible difference that you get there be because of a harshness, that tannin harshness? Interesting proposal for a future experiment. So I uh, appreciate that, Mr. McAwesome. Final comment comes from our friend uh, from Brew United, Olin Suddeth, over on Facebook. He said, to me, the real value of these findings are that nobody claimed that tinctures tasted bad. That means that I can pull a pint of the base beer, use an eyedropper of the tinctures, and dial in the exact spice level that I want. Whole spices in the fermenter mean I get what I get. 
Yep, exactly. Yeah, this is another one. Yeah, so a lot of comments on this. A lot of people have the same experience that that I do. You know, once you add the spices, once you add the direct spices in the fermenter, you can't adjust it anymore. Well, I mean, you can always add more, right? Uh, but you can't. <laughs> you can't take it away you, though. Yeah, you can't take it away. Uh, you know, so so yeah, using an eyedropper with the finish or with a you know an an unspiced uh, beer is a great way to dial in a recipe, and it's a really simple way to yeah. dial in a recipe, you know, rather than having to waste a full five gallon batch. I, and I don't say waste. I mean, you know, you know, most people are going to drink the beer, uh, just yeah. cause, <laughs> yeah, cause <laughs> their they friends will it. at the very least. Yeah. Yeah. Their friends <laughs> will. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. I had a, uh, a beer that I uh, used some raspberries. I did a, a, a raspberry, uh, double. Um, that, I don't know why this reminded me of that, but I just rad raspberry double and I hated it. I was like, I, this is disgusting. All my friends came over and they drank the crap out of it. They loved it. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, this beer is horrible. I don't know why I go for it. <laughs> Get it right. out of my taps. <laughs> oh, but anyway, it's so funny. Yeah, sorry, I <laughs> got off topic uh, there a little bit. But yeah, I mean, you know, use use the tinctures to adjust. And then, hey, like I said, you know, if you want to use the tincture in the fermenter, that's also fine, too. You know, yeah. there's nothing, doesn't seem to be anything wrong with either of those yeah. approaches. I, I'll be honest, uh, I don't I do not do, you know, the spice beer very often. But just talking about tinctures has, has uh, kind of, you know, piqued my curiosity. I, th I, I think I might go and make a couple of tinctures and just let them sit around in my garage on the shelf and mm -hmm. mess around with beers Perhaps listening to us uh, talk about tinctures will yeah. inspire you to do the same. Uh, that does bring us to the end of another episode. Kate, is there anything else on brewing with spices or using tinctures before we wrap things up? I should have said it earlier, but uh, tasting the tincture, man, that tasted really good. I could have yeah. probably just drank the vodka uh, with the orange peel and coriander and peppercorn. It was super <laughs> unique, like super, it tasted floral, even though I know there's no floral spices in it, but maybe that's the bitter orange peel with the coriander. But yeah, I yeah. mean, there's there's an idea for you. If you're going to make a bunch of tinctures and put them up on the shelf, just have a bunch of different vodkas that you can pull down every now and then. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, don't forget to head over to brewlosophy.com to read up on the experiment we discussed in this episode, as well as all of the other stuff we're up to. The Brewlosophy podcast is made possible by the generous support of our sponsors as well as all of our rad listeners. We seriously could not do this without you. Cheers to everyone who has subscribed and left a review of our show. It makes a huge difference. If you haven't yet, please consider doing so. Head over to brewlosophy.com slash support to view a list of ways you can easily help us to continue producing this podcast. If you want a reward for your support, visit patreon.com slash brewlosophy. Thanks again for listening. We'll be back next week with another episode of the Brewlosophy podcast. Until then, think beer. Start off the morning with some hot tea, lemon and honey, cause it suits my bro. Put some herb in the bowl, yeah, it's homegrown. Ain't gotta go through the middle man, no. Man.